Hello, everyone. I'm glad you could join me for this session, a deep dive into Docker. Just a bit about myself first. My name is Andrew Prusky. I'm a SQL Server DBA, Microsoft Data Platform MVP, and certified Kubernetes administrator. I'm originally from Swansea, Wales, but I've been living in Dublin, Ireland for coming up to seven years now. My Twitter handle, at DBA from the cold, and my email address, dbafromthecold.com, are on the slide there. So if you have any questions after today, please feel free to reach out. I'm always willing to talk about this stuff. My blog's there as well, dbafromthecold.com, posted multiple articles about running SQL Server in containers, some of which I'm basing this session on, and some of which do tend to go off on tangents, but you're more than welcome to check those out. And then finally, my GitHub account. All the slides and the code for this session are on my GitHub account, and I'll post a link to that at the end. So on to the session. The aim of this session is to provide a deeper knowledge of the Docker platform. We've all spun up a SQL Server container before and played around with it, but I want to dive in just a little bit deeper and have a look at some of the stuff that's A, happening in the background, and some more options that we have when we run containers. So we're going to start off with looking at container isolation. How are containers isolated from the host? Container networking. How do we connect to containers and how containers connect to each other? Persisting our data. For SQL Server folks, data is important to us. We'll have a look at the different options for persisting our data for SQL Server in a Docker container. Then we'll have a look at Docker Compose, an easier way to spin up containers. And then finally, to round off the session, we'll have a look at non-root containers. We're going to do tons of demos, so let's get started and dive into the Docker platform. The first area I want to talk about is container isolation. The quote on the slide there is from the Docker website, and it says that a container is an isolated environment that contains all the necessary binaries or libraries required by a piece of software so that it can run in the same manner regardless of its environment. What does that isolated environment mean? How is that achieved? Well, it's achieved through various concepts, the first one being control groups or C groups. Control groups limit the resources of the host that is available to a container. Now, this, has, this is kind of handy, especially when we're running multiple containers on a host, because we don't want all those containers to be able to take all the resources of the host, because we could end up in a situation where one container takes all those resources, and starts affecting the performance of all the other containers. So we can implement resource limiting using Docker run and flags such as dash dash CPUs to limit the CPU that is available to a container, or the dash dash memory flag and limit the memory available to a container. And what is happening in the background is that Docker is placing that container in a control group, and that's limiting the resources to that container. And we can see this in action by going and having a look at those control groups and seeing those limits in place. The next concept I want to talk about are namespaces. If control groups control what a container can use, namespaces control what a container can see. And we see this in action with, if we jump into a container and have a look at the host name, we will see that that host name is different to the host name of the host that that container is running on. This is due to that container being in a namespace, specifically the Unix time sharing system namespace. Another example are processes that the container can see. If we're in a container, have a look at the processes. We won't see all the processes of the host. We will only see a subset of them. And those process IDs will be different if we have a look at them in the container than if we view them on the host. This is due to that container being in what's known as the process ID namespace. Now, another namespace I want to mention is the user namespace. Now, the user namespace allows for users in a container to be mapped to different users on the host. But by default, Docker doesn't implement this. And Kubernetes, as far as I'm aware, doesn't implement it at all. What this means is that a re uh, an application running as root in a container will run as root on the host. And that can cause issues, and we'll see that later in the session. The final thing I want to talk about is the file system. Containers do not see the entire host file system. They only see a subset of that file system. If you jump into a container and run ls at the root, you will see a whole bunch of files. And it will look like 
the root of the host, but it's not. It is just a little subset, subset of that host file system. And this is because the container's root directory is changed upon startup. So, talked a few concepts. Let's dive into a demo and have a look at these in action. OK, here I am in Visual Studio Code connected to my container host, which is a Linux machine running up in Azure. So let's go ahead and let's run a Docker container. And what I'm going to do is limit the memory available to it using the memory flag. So with this container, I'm going to limit its memory just to 2 gig. Hit Execute. I'm getting a warning there about my kernel not supporting swap capabilities, but that's OK. I'm going to continue on, no problem. Confirming the container is up and running. And there we go. Status of up, created nine seconds ago. Got my ports mapped, and I've run it from the 2019 CU5 Ubuntu 18.04 image. Now, what I can do, if I don't want to get all that information back from Docker Container LS, is I can list the containers using a Go template. If I do that, I've limited the columns on the output just to names, image, status, and ports. Ah, the real application, it just looks a little bit prettier when I'm doing a demo. But there we are, my container is up and running. So let's grab that container ID. And now I can have a look at the control groups that have been created for that container. And looking down, we can see that we have a memory and CPU control group. So let's have a look at those control groups themselves. So assign these control groups to a variable. There it is. There it is. I can get my memory limit by looking at the memory.limiting bytes file in that file path location for the memory control group. So I grab that. And then I can divide that because it's in bytes. So divide it by 1024 to get kilobytes, and then divide it again to get the megabytes. And there we are, 2048. There is the control group limit for my container. Having a look at the CPU. We can do the same thing. We have a look at CFS quota US. And we can see that that's set to minus one. So there is no limit on the amount of CPU this container can take on the host. So not particularly great, but minus one is the value for unlimited. So I would always recommend that you use memory and CPU limits when you run your containers. As I mentioned earlier on, otherwise we'll end up in a situation where a container could take all the resources of the host. So it's best practice to always run with the CPU and memory flag. OK, let's have a look at this Docker host. It's called Linux One. Now, if I jump into the container, well, I'm not going to jump into the container. What I'm going to do is use docker exec and then run a command in the container. So I'm doc docker exec, my container name, test container one, and then the command I want to run. And this is going to be host name. And there we are. We can see that the host name within the container is different to the actual host name of the host Docker is running on. This is due to that container being in the Unix time sharing system namespace. OK, so let's have a look at the user details within that container. There we are. We can see that the user that containers running as is user MS SQL, user ID of 10001. And I can actually change the user that I exec into a container by using the dash U flag. So I'm going to say dash U0, and that switches me to the root user. Now, this could be handy when we want to get root access into a container. So we can actually jump into the container using docker exec dash U0, and we'll jump into the container as the root user. Let's have a look at the processes running within that container. I'm going to say docker exec, my container name, and I'm going to run ps aux. There we go. We can see three commands running, my command and the two SQL Server processes. Let's have a look at those on the host. There we go. We can see our SQL Server processes. But look, the PIDs are different, but the user is not the same. Is Sorry, the user is the same. So the container is in a process ID namespace, which changes the PID. And it's also why in the container we can only see those processes. But it's not in a user namespace. The user is mapped 
to the same user on the host, even though it doesn't exist. This 10001 user is the ID of the MS SQL user in the container. Let's have a look at that. Let's spin up a container from a custom image which runs SQL as root. So this is a custom image I have up on the Docker Hub. And all it's doing is switching SQL to run as the root user. So I'm going to run that. And let's have a look at those host processes again. There we go. We can see our new processes here. And they are running as root. If a process runs as root in a container, it runs as root on the host. It's not taking advantage of that user namespace, which is available. So that can cause issues. And we'll have a look at that later on in the session. OK, let's go back to the first container. And let's create a database in that container called test database. So I'm going to use the MS SQL CLI, connecting localhost, and the port that I mapped, 15789, user, password, and my create database statement. That should run at some point, And we'll get our database created within our container. There we go. And I can have a look at those database files within the container with Docker exec again. Now, I didn't specify any file location, so it's going to use the default, which is var opt MS SQL data. And there at the bottom there, we can see the database files under var opt MS SQL data. Let's have a look at those on the host. ls var opt MS SQL data on the host. That directory does not exist because the root of our container has been changed upon startup. So that is actually in a different location. The container thinks it's var opt MS SQL data, but it's actually a different location on the host. And the container can only see that little subset of the file system of the host. And we can grab that by using Docker expect and having a look at the merge directory. So if I grab that and then have a look at that root directory, there's a var directory down there. So let's have a look at those database files. And that's where they live on the host. So the container thinks it's var opt MS SQL data, but it's actually that big long file path and then var opt MS SQL data. The root directory of the container was changed. OK, a little bit of a cleanup. And let's jump back into the slides. The next section I want to talk about is container networking, or how we connect to containers and how containers connect to each other. If you run Docker Network LS on a container host, you will see three networks there. Bridge, which I'll come to in a second, host, and none. If you run a container on the host network, you're effectively removing the isolation from the container networking stack and the host networking stack. They share the same networking namespace, which means we connect to the application within the container on the host IP address and whichever port is exposed from the container. So this would be port 1433 for SQL Server. Now, this can be handy in certain situations, but it does mean you can't have multiple containers running our host on the host network or listening on the same port. So for SQL Server, wouldn't really recommend it. The NUN network does effectively what it says on the tin. It disables the container's networking stack. And so we won't be able to connect SQL outside the container. We'd have to exec in and then use a command line tool like SQL Command or MS SQL I, MS SQL CLI to connect to SQL within that container. Can be handy if you want to run a really isolated environment for testing. But the one I want to talk about is the bridge network. In Docker terms, a bridge network is a software bridge that containers connect to, and they are isolated from all other containers that aren't on that network. It is the default network. So if you run a container and don't specify a network, this is the network that container is going to connect to. It's represented as Docker 0 in the host networking stack. And containers on the bridge network all communicate by IP address. So containers can talk to each other on the default bridge network using their IP address. It supports port mapping. And we see this all the time when we run a container. We use a dash p or dash dash publish flag, pick a port on the host, pick it out of thin air. We just need a port that's not in use on the network, so say 15789, and map it to a port in the container. 1433. And this means that when we're on the host and we're trying to connect via Management Studio or Azure Data Studio or a command line tool, we can say localhost, comma, the port number that we've mapped, and that will map our connections through into our container 
and we can connect to SQL Server. So those are three there by default, but Docker does allow for us to create our own network. And it allows for certain drivers for us to use. The three we've already talked about, host, none, and bridge. We've also got Mac VLAN, which allows us to assign a Mac address to our Docker container, so it appears as a physical device on the network. And overlay, and overlay is used in Docker Swarm for connecting multiple Docker daemons together. But the default is bridge. So if we create a network and don't specify a network driver, we're going to get a user-defined bridge network. And this provides several advantages over the default bridge network. The, way, may, the main one for me being it enables DNS resolution of container names to IP addresses. So containers on a, D, on a custom bridge network can communicate with each other via their container name. Really handy for spinning up an environment where you want multiple SQL instances talking to each other so you can use a container name. Containers can be connected to more than one custom network, and we can attach and detach containers from a user-defined network without having to restart them, which is really handy. So let's go ahead and head into a demo and have a look at some container networking. OK, here we are back in Visual Studio Code. And the first thing I'm going to do is have a look at the networks that I have available to me. And there we are. I have the three defaults. I have bridge, host, and none. I can dive a little bit further into those networks by using the Docker networking spec command. So let's have a look at the bridge network. No containers connected to it at the moment. And I can see its subnet there. OK. Let's run two containers on that default bridge network. And let's note, I'm not publishing any ports here. I'm not mapping any ports from the host to the container. I'm just going to spin them up as they are. And I'm using a custom SQL image here. And all this is a, is a custom image built from a Microsoft SQL Server image with things like ping and MS SQL CLI installed. So spinning those up. Confirm that they're running using Docker container LS and our Go template. And there they are, test container one, test container two, status of up, all good. Let's have a look at that bridge network again. And this time, I can see that I have my two containers on that bridge network. And I can see their IP addresses, dot zero, dot three for test container two, dot zero, dot two for test container one. You can also grab that with inspecting the containers themselves. So I can say docker inspect container name, use a go template again, network settings and IP address, and assign each of that to a variable. So let's try something here. But on the default bridge network, let's try pinging one container from the other using the container name. And it comes back straight away, test container two, name not known. This is because DNS resolution for container names is not supported on the default bridge network. However, I can ping the containers using their IP address. So containers on the default bridge network can communicate using their IP addresses. And I can connect from the host to SQL in the container using that container's IP address and the default port, which is 1433. And we can see there, it runs a simple command, select that at version, and we get Microsoft SQL Server 2019 CU5 returned. OK, let's blow those containers away. Let's get rid of them and let's spin them back up. And this time, I'm going to use the dash dash add host flag to drop an entry for the other container in that container's host file. So I'm saying test container two there with its IP address and test container one there with its IP address. Let's spin them back up. And now let's try pinging again using the container name from one container to the other this time it works. So that is one way we can get containers talking to each other by container name when they are on the default bridge network. OK, there are some disadvantages. You do know, need to know the container IP address before you spin up the container, but it is a nice workaround. Now, this time, let's spin up two more containers on the default bridge network. And this time, I am going to use the publish flag. So this time, I'm publishing, sorry, Publishing 15789 on the host to 1433 within the container. 
I don't really like that name publish. I prefer map, but because that's what we're doing. We're mapping the port on the host to the port in the container, but there we are. And I'm going to do the same for the next container, this time 15799 to 1433 in the container. And I'm just picking these ports out of thin air on the I just need a port on the host that's not in use. So let's spin those up. Excellent stuff. And if I want to have a look at the port mapping, I can use Docker port and the container name. I can see them there, 1433 to 1579989. Cool. Now I can connect to SQL in one of those containers from the host using my command line tool, MS SQL CLI. And this time I'm using localhost and the port that I've mapped. And people should be used to seeing this. Most people, when they spin up a container, use the dash P or dash dash publish flag to map a port on the host to the container. It's nice and easy. It's also a really easy way. We just use localhost and the port that we've mapped instead of having to go and get that container's IP address. And there we are, I'm connected in, using our version again, same image, so it's the same version of SQL. Okay, now let's create a custom network. So I'm saying Docker network create and giving that network a name. This time it's gonna be SQL Server. There we go, list the networks. Docker network ls, and we can see my new network is created. I didn't specify a driver for my network, so I got the default, which is bridge. So let's go ahead and let's create two containers on that custom network using the network flag. Execute that. There we go. And now let's just immediately see if we can ping by name and bump. They are on a user defined bridge network. So DNS resolution is available. I didn't have to use the add host flag or do anything else. It's automatically enabled for me. So if you want containers to talk to each other, I'd always recommend spinning up a custom network and attaching your containers to it. And we can have a look at the DNS settings of those containers. There we go. 127.0.0.11 is Docker's built-in DNS server, which is available to my container because it's on that custom bridge network. Okay, bit of a cleanup, and we'll dive back into the slides. Now let's have a look at how we can persist our data for Docker containers. We're all SQL Server folks, data is important to us, and sometimes we want to persist our data from one container to another. And thankfully, Docker provides several options for us. The first one being bind mounts, or mounting volumes from the host. Now this works really well if we have large databases that we want to attach into a SQL instance running in a container. We take the volume on the host, mount it into the container, and then we can attach the databases to the SQL instance, do our work, and then when we blow the container away, we've still got those database volumes on the host. The second option is data volume containers. Now this is slightly tricky. What we do is we create a container. We don't run it, we just create it with a load of volumes in it. And then we spin up another container and mount the volumes from our data volume container into our running container. And this can be really handy if we have a lot of volumes. We just specify them once, and then we can use a flag dash dash volumes from our data volume container. It's nice and easy, mounts it in. But what that actually does in the background is create named volumes. So this is the one I would recommend if you want to persist your data for SQL Server in a Docker container. We create our volume, say Docker volume create, or we can specify them at runtime. And then when we create our container, we have those name volumes mapped into volumes in our container. When we blow our container away, we still have those name volumes and we can mount them into another container and we've persisted our data changes from one container to another. So let's go ahead and have a look at persisting data for Docker containers in a demo. Okay, we're back in Visual Studio Code, and let's explore persisting our data from one container to the other. So the first thing I'm gonna do is create a named volume called SQL Server with Docker volume create. There we go. And then I can list all the named volumes on my host with Docker volume LS. And there is the one named volume I have that I've just created called SQL Server. Okay, so let's spin up a container with that named volume mapped, and I'm gonna, Use the dash dash volume flag, map my name volume SQL server to var opt SQL server within the container. 
So docker container run. And there we go. OK, let's make sure that container is running using docker container ls and the go template. There it is, up five seconds. And now let's create a database using the MS SQL CLI. And we're going to create that database on our named volume. So hit execute. Oh, OK. We've had an error there. Let's have a look at that. Let's have a look at that directory within the container. Ah, OK. So for SQL Server 2019, SQL does not run as root. It runs as the MS SQL user. But that directory I've created is running that the owner of it is root. So SQL doesn't have access to that location. So I need to change the owner of that of that volume, or that file, folder even, to MS SQL. So I'm saying Docker exec as my root user in my container, changing the owner to MS SQL here. So let's hit execute there. And let's try creating that database again. Oop. And this time, it completes successfully because SQL has access to that location. I can confirm the databases there with select name from sys databases. There it is. But let's blow that container away. OK, so we've spun up a container, given SQL access to a custom directory in the container. And now, confirming that container is gone, we still have that name volume with our database files on it. So let's spin up another container, mapping that volume again. Make sure it's running. There we go. And now, because we've mapped that name volume back into our second container, we don't need to change the owner of that name volume because it has persisted the owner of that name volume to the MS SQL user from one container to the other. So no need to change the owner. I can go ahead and remap that database. So create database with using for attach. And there we go. Let's have a look. Confirm my database is there. There we are. We have persisted our database, our data changes from one container to another by using a name volume. OK, so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to blow that container away, and I'm going to get rid of that volume as well using Docker volume prune force. So get rid of everything. Let's create a couple more name volumes. This time, I'm going to create one called the MS SQL system and MS SQL user. Excellent stuff. And there's my volumes. OK, so what we did in the previous demo was we had to manually reattach our databases. But what if we could spin up a container, create databases, blow that container away, reattach name volumes to another container, spin that container up, and our databases were there automatically. So let's spin up a container with a volume mapped. And this time, I'm going to use the MS SQL system name volume and map that to var opt MS SQL. And this is where the system databases, specifically the master database, resides. Then same as before, I'm going to map the MS SQL user name volume to var opt SQL server, accept the end user license agreement, set an SA password, setting default directories for my data and log files, specifying the name, and then the image. Let's spin that container up. There we go. Let's make sure it's running. Status of up. All good. OK. Again, we have to change the owner to MS SQL for that custom directory. But now I can create my database. And notice I'm not specifying where I'm putting my files here, because I've set my default data and log directories to that custom var opt SQL server directory. So I'm just going to say 
create database, I'm going to call it test database two. So wait for that to come back, command complete successfully, excellent stuff. Confirm the database is there with select name from sys databases. Cool. And I can also, use, let's run exec sp help file and have a look at where those files are. Excellent stuff. You can see our data and log are in var opt SQL server, our directory that's backed up by our name volume. Okay. Let's jump into the container itself. Let's use Docker exec and we can have a look at the host. There they are. The owner is MS SQL. Okie dokie. So no mucking around. Let's blow that container away. So I'm saying Docker container RM and then Docker container LS as a variable forcing it. And what this does will blow all containers away on the host. But as I've only got the one, I can safely run that. And that container is gone. Confirm the container is gone. Yep, definitely gone. Excellent stuff. So now I can use these name volumes and map them back into another container. Same as we did before, but this time we map in back the location of the master database. Setting our default data directories, giving it a name from our Microsoft image. And let's just run the MS SQL CLI again, localhost and the port that we mapped, and see if our database is there. Excellent stuff. There it is. So by mapping and persisting the master database and using another volume for our user database, when we blew that original container away, we can take the master location, the, the user database container, drop them into another container, spin that container up, and our database, our user database that we created, is already there and good to go. We don't need to run anything to reattach that database. So that is how we can easily persist our data from one container to another using name volumes. OK, let's do a little bit of a cleanup. And there we are. OK. So what I want to do now is very quickly show you a data volume container. So what I'm saying here is I'm saying Docker container create, given that container a name, in this case, it's going to be data store. And then I'm just having, I'm just creating some volumes. So var opt SQL Server data, var opt SQL Server log, and var opt SQL Server backups from the Ubuntu 1804 image. Don't need SQL Server running on this one because I'm just going to take the volumes from this data volume container and drop it into another container. So I'm going to just create that. I don't have the Ubuntu image locally, so it's going to pull that down and then create me my container. Verify my container. There it is. Status of created. It's not running. It's just created, and it has its volumes there. So now I can go ahead. There we are. What it's done in the background actually is create name volumes. So I've got those three there. The volume names are horrendous. But those are the three volumes that I created when I span up my data volume container. So now I can spin up a container with a volume map from my data container using volumes from, and then my data container name, data store. Specifying the default data directories for data log and backup. There we go. Spun up my container. Confirm that it's running. There it is up to five seconds. I have to change the owner of that SQL Server directory again, because it will be marked as root. And now I can create my database. Let's have a look at those database files. And there we go. Because I set the default data and log directories when I spun my container up, I didn't have to specify them when I created the database. And there they are on var op SQL Server data, var op SQL Server log, which are backed up with name volumes from my data volume container. So that's another way we can use and create name volumes and persist our data from one container to another. OK, let's jump back into the slides. Now let's have a look at 
Docker Compose. But first, let's have a look at the run statement using some of the concepts we've already talked about, say, creating a custom network, mapping volumes. It gets kind of large. So we're saying Docker run, dash D, demonize our container, run it in the background. Publish, so we're mapping our ports here. We're mapping port 15789 on the host to port 1433 within the container. And now we can set some environment variables, setting our SA password, accepting the end user license agreement, switching on the agent, specifying the default data directory, default log directory, default backup directory, running this container on a custom network called SQL Server. And here we're mapping our name volume. So SQL system to var opt MS SQL, the default location for our system databases, our SQL data, SQL log, SQL backup, all the locations specified by our environment variables, giving our container a name, and then specifying the image we want to build our container from. So that's kind of involved. And do I really want to be having to type that out every single time I want to run a container? OK, I could drop it in the script and just call the script. But there is an easier way, and that is Docker Compose. Now, the definition there is from the Docker website. It's basically saying the Docker Compose is where we define all of our containers in YAML files and then spin them up with one easy command. So instead of having that gigantic run statement, we define everything we want in configuration files and then use docker-compose up to spin everything up. Far easier. And let's go have a look at that in a demo. OK, we're back in Visual Studio Code. And I'm going to navigate to a directory on my host where I have all my compose files. And in that directory is a Docker file. So let's have a look at that Docker file. There we go. It's a very simple Docker file. All this is doing is spinning up a new image based on the Microsoft SQL Server 2019 CU5 Ubuntu 18.04 image, switching to the user root, making a load of directories, and then changing the owner of those directories to the MS SQL user. So this means that when I spin up a container from this image, and I want to map some directory name volumes and things like that, I will not have to change the owner of those directories like we did in the persistent data demo. They'll already be changed for me. So I can go ahead and just start creating my databases. Then I'm switching to the MS SQL user and starting up SQL Server. So SQL Server still runs as the MS SQL user and not the root user. Also in that directory, I have an environment variable file. So I'll have a look at that. And in here, I'm just setting my SA password, accepting the end user license agreement, enabling the agent, setting my default data, log, and backup directories. OK, having the SA password in a config file probably isn't great. So I wouldn't do this if I was doing publishing this to, say, a GitHub account. But just to show you what can be done with this environment variable file. And then finally, in that Compose directory, we have the Docker Compose YAML file itself. If we have a look at that, specifying a version, and then we come down to our services. So I'm going to call this SQL Server 1. I have a build directory, context of dot. So what this is going to do is look in the current directory for something called a Docker file. And it's going to build me a container from that Docker file. Then I'm mapping some ports. 15789, as we did in previous demos, to port 1433, the default port in the container, specifying my, uh, my environment file, my SQL server.env, in the same location as my Docker Compose file, specifying some volumes, and we should be good to go. And this is going to create us some name volumes on the system for us. So let's have a quick look at the Docker networks on the host. I've got the default three. No custom ones there at the moment. I can check the name volumes on the host as well. I have no name volumes whatsoever. And the images on the host as well. So I have my custom, custom SQL Server images with tools and one that runs as root, the Ubuntu 18.4 image, and then the Microsoft SQL Server 2019 CU5 image. OK. Now let's spin up a container with Docker Compose. So remember that big, long Docker container run statement? 
I don't need to do that anymore. All I can have to say is Docker dash compose up. And then I'm saying dash D to run everything in the background. So here we go. Docker compose up. It's creating a network, creating volumes. And now it's building me my custom image. We can see it stepping through each one of the stages here. From my image, switching to user root, creating a load of directories, changing the owner of those directories, and then spinning up SQL Server. We can see that it successfully tagged my image as compose SQL Server 1 latest. And we can see we've got a warning on the bomb. The image was built because it didn't already exist. And I can rebuild it if I want to use Docker Compose build. But I don't want to, so let's carry on and let's have a look at what we've got. So let's recheck the Docker networks on the host. We have Docker Network LS. And there we are. We have a custom default network created for us as a bridge network. You check the name volumes. And I have a bunch of name volumes created for me as well. And then let's have a look at the images. At the top there, my custom image that was built from my Docker file that I specified in my Docker Compose YAML configuration file. OK, check the containers are running. There it is. I can see it was up, status of up, created 50 seconds ago, name Compose SQL Server 1 1. So I've got my custom network, name volumes, custom image, and my container spun up just from that one command Docker Compose up. And so let's have a look. Let's double check that. Remember, in the persistent data demo, we had to go ahead and change the owner of our volumes that were mounted, for, that were backed up with name volumes. I don't have to do that here. I did that all in my custom image. So there we go. That's created successfully. And we can have a look at those. There they are. The owner is MS SQL. So really nice, easy way of spinning up a custom image of SQL Server, creating name volumes on a custom network just with that one easy command. Oh. Let's have a look at that database. Make sure it's there. There it is. OK, so now I want to get rid of my container. I've done my work. I want to tidy up for the day. Docker Compose down. We can see it's stopping my container. Wait for it. Getting rid of my network and removing the container as well. OK, so let's have a look at that network again. Custom network is gone. Containers, definitely gone. But I still have my name volumes. And I still have my custom image. So I wanted to spin this back up. I could get my databases back very, very easily just by Docker Compose up again. Nice, easy way of creating a custom image with a container with name volumes, all in that one easy command. Let's jump back into the slides. The final section I want to talk about are non-root containers. You may have noticed if you've run Docker logs, your container name for a container running SQL Server 2019, that you've got this message at the top. SQL Server 2019 will run as non-root by default. Now, earlier editions of SQL in Docker containers ran as root. And as we saw earlier, an application running as root in a container will run as root on the host. And that can cause issues. So let's jump straight into a demo and have a look at why that can be a problem. OK, and we're back in Visual Studio Code for our final demo, looking at root containers and why that can be an issue. So I'm on my Linux host here, and I have a user called Andrew. I'm going to try and run sudo with him. And I get a message saying, Andrew is not allowed to run sudo on Linux 1. He's not in the sudo group, and I can check that with this command. And the only user in the sudo group is the user I'm currently logged in as DBA from the cold. OK, let's switch to that user, Andrew. Type in my password. There we go. I'm now running as Andrew on my host. Try switching to root. Now I get a scary message saying I'm not in the sudoers file, and this incident will be reported. OK, but Andrew is in the group that allows him to run 
Docker containers. So let's spin up a Docker container. I'm going to mount the Etsy directory to the Etsy directory within the container. Spinning up from a custom image, and this is just SQL Server 2019 CU5, which is running as root in the container. So spinning that up, if we have a look at the log of the container, we can see that SQL Server will run as non-root by default, but this container is running as user root. That's because in my custom image, I'm actually specifying user root and then spinning up SQL Server. I can see this on the host as well. There we go. There's my SQL Server processor there in my container running on the, as root on the host. So because that user namespace isn't enabled in Docker by default, any processes running as root in a container will run as root on the host, which means I can jump into that container, add my user to the pseudo group in the container, jump out of the container and the user, and now check that pseudo group. Andrew may run the following commands on Linux 1. All and all. This is because I map that Etsy directory from the host to the container. The container is run as root, which basically means it now has access to Etsy directory on the host. And even though I added the user Andrew to the sudoers file, sudoers group, sorry, in the container, because of the mapping, it also added it on the host. Run as root gave it access, which means I can switch back to Andrew. And now switch to root. So by spin up a container using those mappings, if the container has a process run as root within it, it grants it root on the host. And I was able to get root access on the host because of that. And this is one of the reasons why running applications as root in a container is really not a good idea. I'm really glad that Microsoft switched back to running, sorry, not switch back, switch to running SQL Server as a custom user. Okay, fine, tidy up. Coming out of that, coming out of Andrew. Let's remove him. And let's blow away that container. Okay, let's jump back into the slides. Okay, to round the session off, we've got some resources for you here. The first link there is a link to my GitHub repo for this session. All the slides and the code for the demos are available there. The second link is a link to my blog where I have a summary of all the posts that I've written about running SQL Server in containers. And the third link there is, again, a link to a wiki on GitHub, which will be a complete guide to running SQL Server in a container. Thank you very much for watching my session, and enjoy the rest of the day.